The United States stands firmly with the people of Cuba as they assert their universal rights. And we call on the government, the government of Cuba, to refrain from violence and our attempts to silence the voice of the people of Cuba. The Biden administration does not have a plan at the moment. It is crafting its plan because so far they weren't prioritizing this. It sure feels like a world in disarray this week, from assassinations in Haiti to the Brazilian president trying to call off elections to protests spilling out onto the streets, raw anger in Cuba against the 62-year-old communist regime. I'm Ryan Heath, your stand-in Ryan for the week as Ryan Lizza takes vacation, joining me to unpack everything that's going on in Havana, in Miami, in Washington, D.C. I'm delighted to introduce to you Sabrina Rodriguez. Hey! I'm excited to be with the other Ryan. Excellent. <laughs> that's my dog. We know that inflation has been rampant in Cuba. Prices have gone up five to nine times for a lot of key items. Supply is scarce. This is probably something the Biden administration could have seen coming, but they've been pretty flat footed about this initially. Uh, so tell us, why do you think that is? It's not that they didn't have intel on the ground of what the situation looked like. But the Biden administration had said from the get-go that they did not think that the Cuba policy was a top foreign policy priority for them, given that they were focused on China, Russia, and now they're being forced to pay attention to it. We know that the exiled Cuban community in Florida really deserted uh, Joe Biden, and it was never really a strength for the Democrats anyway in recent decades. Uh, so it's been a problem area for the Democrats. How much of this was just not wanting to poke the beast and, and, and pile more onto the Biden administration's plate, do you think? Domestic politics is absolutely a factor. I mean, we saw after the election how well Trump performed in South Florida, which is the predominantly Cuban-American area in, in the United States. The last time there were big protests in Cuba, Fidel Castro effectively said, fine, leave if you want. How does migration politics dynamics change if the new leadership in Cuba says the same thing again? That is a huge fear at the moment. Uh, we've seen, uh, you know, Senator Rubio and, and other Cuban Republicans yesterday have expressed that fear of not wanting to see a crisis like that evolve um, again, as we saw in 1994. But the circumstances are different. In 1994, the United States had in place wet foot, dry foot policy, where if you reach U.S. soil, you automatically could stay. That doesn't exist anymore. Obama on one of his last days in office removed that. There is not some US policy waiting for those people when they arrive. And we've, but we have seen an uptick. The Coast Guard has said, you know, this is a record year. Uh, it's been more than 500 people that have, you know, been interdicted in, in sea compared to about 50 last year, about 300 the year before. The Biden administration, they've been saying so far, you know, we're doing a review. We're not trying to rush into any kind of policy. They saw the backlash that, that ensued from the Obama administration's policy towards Cuba. And there's a whole question, though, of what can they do that would satisfy domestic politics while also addressing the issues on the island? And to some extent, there is a disconnect on that. We should make clear nothing's going to change. There's not going to be any sanctions changed as a result of this. On the contrary, I hope the, Obama, uh, the Biden administration will now announce they have finished their review of Cuba policy and everything that's in place is staying in place. Which is not something that the Biden administration, at least from talking to, to people close to the administration, that the administration is ready to, to commit to. We've seen some people arrested and we're talking about people facing long jail terms just for demanding food and access to, to medicine. So it's really brutal stuff. We have seen the Cuban government respond with internet shutdowns, uh, with blackouts. We call on Cuba's leaders to demonstrate restraint, uh, to urge respect for the voice of the people by opening all means of communication. But it's not clear exactly what the Biden administration could do next, either encourage those protesters or do something else to, to punish the regime and, and sort of tip the scales in this situation. Arrests have been happening, beatings have been happening. There's hundreds of missing people at this point. And now the question is, you know, what are they going to do about it? You said you wanted the, the protest to be peaceful. They are no longer peaceful. Where do you go from there? And all of the openings that President Obama made, which were one-sided, unilateral in terms of concessions, showed themselves to create absolutely no change 
inside of Cuba. Yesterday, I was talking to Senator Bob Menendez, chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. And this is we're talking about a senior Democrat on Capitol Hill. And he's supportive of keeping sanctions in place to maintain that press pressure. And what do you make of some of the ideas from Senator Marco Rubio? One of them was that the U.S. should be enabling satellite internet access for everyone who's been cut off in Cuba. So to some extent, you know, experts on the region say there's a really fine line to tiptoe here of, okay, Cuba is a sovereign country. Let the Cuban people determine their future, but also let's monitor this closely because this is obviously a huge of, of interest to us. Right now, the Cuban regime, what they're doing and taking advantage of is anything that's being said in the United States to try and continue to spin this as U.S. driven that, you know, the protest was because of Yankee imperialism and because of the U.S. embargo. Todas esa, todos esos temas que hoy están presentes en nuestra sociedad como insatisfacción, ¿cuál es el origen de ellos? ¿Cuál es la causa de ellos? Es el bloqueo. At what point might we start talking about something like regime change? We're a long way from having those kinds of conversations. You know, it. we cannot understate enough that the protests were unprecedented. And for now, the United States cannot weigh in on regime change necessarily. Or, and at least that's from, you know, people close to the administration talking, saying that is not the United States' place right now. To go as far as saying regime change is not on the table at the moment.